morning. Good morning. morning, Fountain of Life. My name is Becca. I'm the Worship Arts Director here at FOL, and I'm so glad to see you all here this morning. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. Uh, we're going to open the service this morning with a song, so please, if you're here with us, feel free to stand up, clap, sing, celebrate. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it.
Hallelujah. We serve a risen Savior today. I said we serve a risen Savior today. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. Good morning, Fountain of Life. Good morning. My name is Patrick Yates. I'm part of the pastoral team here. And we welcome you this morning with the love of Christ into this place today. We are glad that you are here. Are you glad to be here today? You're not worried about the rain outside. Anybody worried about the rain outside? Are you worried about trials and tribulations that are in your way today? Are you worried that something bad might happen to you? Or are you concerned that you serve a risen Savior? That you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords? That you've got a God that sits high and looks low? And no matter what is going on in and around you, He's got your back. He's got you covered. And He is living to make intercession on your behalf today. I just give you good news this morning. That God is a God that is faithful that he is omnipotent, that he is strong, that he is true, and he is living to make intercession for us today, for us today. Good morning to those of you that are tuning in online. Thank you for joining with us today and worshiping. No matter where you are across this great land of ours, we appreciate you tuning in and joining and worshiping with us. Smash that like button if you got one to let us know that you are worshiping with us in your homes this morning. Listen, you all, we have a wonderful service planned today. You can see we're coming to the Lord's table. We're going to be starting a new series today. We have a lot of other things, including continue to worship. But before we get to all of that, do we have any first-time visitors in the house today? You young lady, anybody else first-time visitors? Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. God bless you all. Now, FOL, good morning. Thank you for being here. FOL, you know what we do at this time. Good morning back there. Let's greet up, uh, get up and greet our visitors, greet one another, and let's come back and continue to worship our Lord and Savior. some information to share with you this morning uh, regarding our invitations to community and these invitations to community are for all of us here that are in FOL visiting FOL because these are things that we get to take a part in as a part of our worship as a part of the happenings that are going on here at FOL and so we want to share those with you this morning we actually formally call these the announcements 
but now they are invitations to community. So we want to share you with you this morning what's happening here at FOL. The question is, do you want to hear about it? All right, well, I'm going to tell you. The first thing I want to tell you is, if you are new to FOL and would like to officially make FOL your church, your church home, we invite you to join members of our pastoral team after service on Sunday, April 28th. Mark your calendars, April 28th to talk about what it means to join the FOL family here. Uh, we want to meet you and get to know you. Lunch will be prepared as well as child care will be available, so you'll be able to register for that. And we ask that you do it in advance so with, that we can plan appropriately. Uh, that announcement is on the screen. And also, if you go to the website, the FOL app, you will be able to register for that. Any men in the house today? Now you know I'm going to get you. And I'm going to give you another opportunity to respond. But I know if this was tomorrow night and Purdue and UConn was playing, there'd be a whole lot of shouting and a whole lot of, well, you know what I'm saying. There'd be a lot of chatter going on. In fact, some of y'all might have put something on that game, but I'm not going to call nobody out. So are there any men in the house today? That's better. I'll accept that. Listen. Men's Ministry will host a back-to-back -back breakfast seminar focusing on financial literacy and education. All men are invited to ascend next Saturday, April 13th, and Saturday, April 20th from 9 to 11.30 for good food, discussion, and money management strategies. Uh, we're going to be talking about building and maintaining credit, investing, estate planning, and retirement. And so you can go online. You can register for those upcoming events. We ask that you register, not because uh, we're expecting to have counts, but we want to make sure we're planning appropriately for food. Don't come to me and say, Pastor Patrick, I thought there was going to be food, and there ain't none, because I'm going to tell you we ate it up. So please, register, come check us out, come fellowship, and we're actually blessed to have Brother Jason Fields in the building, who is going to be conducting that seminar over the next two Saturdays. So thank you for doing that, uh, Brother Jason. Youth ministry, middle, school, middle and high school ministries are going to be having our next It's Not Monday Yet event. Uh, this Saturday, or this Sunday night, excuse me, April 7th, that's today, from 6 to 8 p.m. here at FOL. Uh, it will be a game night where we will have both video and board games able to be played. Students are encouraged to bring a board or video game of their preference. Uh, we'll also have some snacks available. Please contact Pastor Tyler, Brother Brian Woodland, or Brother Isan Morales for more information on that. So... That is all of our announcements. If you would like to get these announcements in your email, please contact Sister Kim Graffenauer, and she will ensure that you would get these announcements. As always, if you would like to speak with someone from the pastoral team, if you would like a prayer request or just any other general information, um, please use the communication cards that are in the seat pockets of your chairs. You can fill those out, dropping in the offering pans that are down here at often time, and someone will contact you from the office. All right, that's a mouthful. So we are going to transition into our next part of ministry for the day, and we're going to actually have Sister Sherry come up, and she's going to be handling our children's moment today. So let's say amen for Sister Sherry as she comes. Amen. Bless the Lord. All right, I'm going to see how many things I can do with all these hands. So I would like to invite the children up to sixth grade to come sit in the front. Amen. And I want to thank Pastor Tyler and Sister Haley and Allie for inviting me to do this. I think it's so important, and we think it's so important that our children are recognized and that they know they are loved and appreciated. We love and appreciate you guys so much. So I am going to read this story called Moses and the Very Big Rescue. So 
This is a true story from the Bible, and it happened over 3,000 years ago. That's a lot of years. And this is about God's chosen people, and they were put into slavery and captivity. So first, when they came to Egypt, they were welcomed there. But then the Egyptians thought, these people are getting so many. They're growing. There's so many of them. We're getting afraid of them, and we're getting jealous of them, and we're thinking that they might take over one day. So Pharaoh decided to put the people into captivity, into slavery. And so that's where our story is going to begin. And I would like to, did I say I was Sister Sherry? Oh, good. So I would like to know your names. Can we hear your names? Yes, ma'am. Navi, and can you say, I, I think we'll start at the end and go all the way down. And can you guys say your names nice and loudly, all right? We're coming, we're coming. What's your name? Good to meet you. Louder. Okay. Yummy. Tilly. What's your name? Okay, keep going, but say them nice and loud, because I'm going to ask you to help me read this a little bit, and I need to know that you can read loud. Next to Navi. Okay. 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 Still going. Lydia, I know you can talk louder than that. Lydia. Michaela. Do you have a name? Okay. Well, God bless you this morning, and thank you for being here. You're important, so that's why we need to know your names, too. So this book was written by a man named Tim Thornborough, which he's also... Do you know another name for the per person who writes a book? Author, yes. And it was illustrated by Jennifer Davison. And do you know what that means, illustrated by? What does that mean? She, she drew the pictures, Okay. So it goes like this. You've probably learned to count upwards. Can you count with me? One, two, three, four. Okay. But when they fire a rocket into space, or when something amazing is about to happen, we sometimes count downwards. Three, two, one. In this true story from the Bible, God counts down to a very big rescue of his people. God's people had a very big problem. Pharaoh was the king of Egypt. He had made them his slaves. They worked all day, and in the hot sun, they made bricks for Pharaoh's buildings. So they cried out to the Lord for help, and God heard them and planned a very big rescue. God told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. You're going to see this a lot in this story, and when you see it, you can read it with me, okay? God said, I will do amazing things to show him who is really the king of the world. Pharaoh will know that I am the one true God. So Moses went. Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh said, no. Moses said, every time you say no, God will send a terrible disaster. But Pharaoh didn't care. His heart was stubborn and his heart was hard. That's like a tongue twister. His heart was hard. <laughs> God's great countdown began. So what number is that? 10. Moses held out his staff over the river Nile and it turned to blood. But Pharaoh was stubborn. His heart was hard. He would not let them go. Nine. Let my people go, said Moses. No, said Pharaoh. So God sent thousands of hopping, croaking frogs. Eight. Let my people go, said Moses. But Pharaoh said, no. 
and God sent millions of whining, itching gnats. But Pharaoh was stubborn. His heart was hard. Seven, let my people go, said Moses. No, said Pharaoh. So God sent clouds of buzzing, flitting flies. Six, let my people go, said Moses. No, said Pharaoh. So God sent sickness on the cattle and sheep, but Pharaoh was stubborn. The Lord had hardened his heart. Said Moses. No. Said Pharaoh. So God sent a plague of painful purple pus filled boils. Ugh. By now I'd be ready to let God's people go, right? Four. My people go, said Moses. No, said Pharaoh. So God sent huge, hurling, horrible hailstones. You know, those big blocks of what? Ice that fall and destroy cars and houses and stuff. Three, let my people go, said Moses. No, said Pharaoh. So God sent swarms of noisy, hungry locusts. And locusts are like big, huge what? They're, they're bugs. They're like grasshoppers. And they eat everything. So we don't, we don't want the locusts. Two. Two, let my people go, said Moses. No, 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 said Pharaoh. So God sent a deep, inky darkness so no one could see anything. But Pharaoh was stubborn. The Lord had hardened his heart. Pharaoh's like, Pharaoh's like a king, and he thinks that he has all the power. One, let my people go, said Moses. No, said Pharaoh. And Moses had a sad heart as he left Pharaoh because he knew that the last plague would be terrible. Moses told God's people to get ready to go because that night the Lord would bring death to every house in Egypt. The firstborn son would die. God's people all ate a special meal that night. Blood from the lambs they had eaten was put on the doorposts of their houses. So when the Lord saw the blood, he passed over those houses and God's people were safe. But every other house in Egypt, there was death and great sadness. Now, this is a hard story. So after this story, if you want to talk to your children's church teachers and your parents to explain more, they will. Moses said to Pharaoh, Let Did they put it on the stage? I was wondering where you, you guys' eyes went. Okay. Let my people go. And Pharaoh said, yes. Because yes. why did he say Yes. Yeah, because so many terrible things had happened that they were like, okay, we better let these people go because his God is what? Powerful. Anything else? Strong. Our God is strong, powerful, and mighty. And when his people are hurting and in distress, he sends help. So Pharaoh said, yes, God's people set off from Egypt to the land God had promised to them. But Pharaoh was stubborn. His heart was hard. And he chased after God's people with his army and chariots. They, they are trapped by the sea, thought Pharaoh. I will destroy them all. Have you ever seen those shows where the person is wicked and they're like, <laughs> I will destroy them all. So that's how Pharaoh, that's how Pharaoh was. Okay. God reached the end of the countdown. Let's count down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Moses held up his staff and the sea parted before him. All God's people walked through the sea and got safely to the other side. 
But when Pharaoh and his horses and chariots tried to follow, the sea rushed back in and they were drowned. God had rescued his people from Egypt. Moses and the people danced and sang a song together. There is no one like you, Lord. You do great miracles and wonders. You keep your promises and save your people. Let's sing it together. Praise the Lord. Okay, two more times. Praise the Lord. One more time. Praise the Lord. Woo! So our God is God. And he loves each and every one of you. And he will answer your prayers and rescue you just like he rescued the people of Israel. Because we are now his people when we believe and love and obey God. Was this a good story? Yeah. Amen to this story. Woo-woo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for letting me read to you. So you can go back to your seats with your parents or wherever you're going right now. And thank you. Can we say amen again for Sister Sherry and the children? That was one of my all-time favorite stories as a child. And probably because of all the things that God did to a hard-headed Pharaoh. I mean, some of us have been hard-headed once or twice, I would imagine. I said, some of us probably been hard-headed once or twice in our lifetime. But blessed be to the Lord for a God that is kind and that has grace and has extended that to us. Amen, amen. We're going to turn our attention to the Word of God this morning. Again, I mentioned we're going to be starting a new series today. Uh, we have been going through this year. We preached about our, our mission uh, statement this year and we talked about the mission of Jesus and so now we're transitioning to what's in our hand what is in our hand and Pastor Tyler is going to be kicking off that series talking about Moses amen so if you would we're going to be reading from Exodus the third chapter verses 1 through 14 and then also Exodus the fourth chapter verses 1 through 5. If you can stand, if you're able for the reading of God's word. And for those of you tuning in online, this might be a great time as we're coming to the communion table to grab uh, your juice and your crackers to partake in coming to the table with us. Again, Exodus, the third chapter, verses 1 through 14, and Exodus chapter 4, 1 through 5 from the New Living Translation this morning. One day Moses was tending flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, 
the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Exodus 4, verses 1 through 5. But Moses protested again, what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. John, could we go back to the last page of the book? You can just remain standing for a minute. I'm asking this him on the fly here. There we go. Can we read this together just by way of worship? Can we, um, when they say there is no one like you, Lord, let's read that together. Can you see it okay? All right, let's go. There is no one like you, Lord. You do great miracles and wonders. You keep your promises and save your people. Praise, Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. All right, you all can be seated, and we're going to minister this song.
Amen. Thank you, choir, for helping us to remember the excellence of what God is. God, I thank you so much that you are excellent, Lord, that you, in a world full of other things that are untrustworthy, in a world full of other things that we can't truly count on to be excellent, Lord, you are excellent. You are one who brings deliverance. You are one who brings freedom. You are one who brings goodness. You bring hope. You bring life. You bring liberty into places that we feel darkness, Lord Jesus. And so I thank you so much that you are excellent. Lord, as we enter to worship today, God, may we declare your excellence. May we remember, may we sing songs of praise like, like the Israelites did as they were delivered, Lord Jesus. I pray that we would know deep in our spirits and our souls a story of truth, a story of goodness, and a story of excellence that is you, Lord Jesus. May we worship you, and may our space and time this morning be a reflection of who you are. May we worship you, Lord, today. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Choir, that was excellent. Very, very excellent. I'm really thankful that um, people are able to use what is in their hand and that the choir is able to use what is in their hand. Uh, I am certainly not someone who has in my hand vocal capabilities or anything like that. I hope that this is more of a space for me, but... Thank you again so much for using your gifts and who you are and how God has really created you specifically to bless us. And to, uh, I was sitting with one of our first time visitors here this morning and uh, he was joining and he was like, wait, are they gonna come out and do a harmony? Like three, four parts? And I was like, mm, yeah. And he's like, I should have been coming to this church a long time ago, <laughs> which I thought that was funny. So great job, great job. Well, this morning, um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here at Fountain of Life. If this is your first time, it's really, really wonderful to be with you this morning and to be able to share uh, the word with you this morning. As Pastor Patrick noted, we have been in a, in a series leading up, and, and Pastor G, I'm really thankful that he trusts me and he trusts our, our different pastors with uh, the pulpit and the place where we're able to preach, especially in his absence. For those of you who know, uh, he's been in the process of grieving the loss of his mother and our church founder, as well as um, with all the stuff happening with the Center for Black Excellence, which if you've seen him laying out the vision and things going on there, he has a number of things and places he's at right now and what he's doing, but he has entrusted his pastoral team and preaching team to be able to hold down the fort here and to share words of encouragement, words of life um, that we believe God gives us. And so one of the things about our series, this, this series right now, it's called What's in Your Hand, is I actually got to sit down with Pastor. Um, some of you may know I often um, get to preach, or I, I often sit down with him and help him think through some of the different places we're going when it comes to whether it's... Um, uh, the next series or the next thing that we're going to work through. And so at the beginning of the year, even before Mother V had passed at all, we had actually sat down and planned out all the way through May what we're going to be the series that we'd be doing. And so it's been beautiful to, to see those come about. So if you've been with us, you know that we had been going through the mission and vision in the first two months. We were talking really deeply about what is our mission and vision at Fountain of Life, which ultimately leads us to enter to worship and exit to serve. From there on, leading up to Easter, we were talking about Jesus' death and resurrection and Jesus' specific assignment. We were saying, what is it now that we know what our mission and vision is? What is the specific assignment that Jesus has been given? And Jesus comes and he, he, he loves us and he chooses to die for us, to free us, to bring us liberty from our sins and to bring us together. And so the natural question from there, right? becomes, okay, so we've talked a little bit about what our mission and vision is. We've talked about that as a church and a community. We've talked about what Jesus's mission was in coming to earth. And then the, what actually becomes our place in that? Like I myself would be wondering, what is the next thing? What, what does it mean for me individually then to be thinking about enter to worship and exit to serve and also following Jesus, being Jesus followers in the world? And, um, you know, if you're anything like me, that question can be a difficult question to wrestle with because I always want to be the person who knows the exact right thing to do in the right situation the right way. I've been thinking about this a lot as I've been watching March Madness this year. I don't know how many of you have been watching March Madness. Um, yes. Uh, you know, people with brackets, did anyone have any success in their brackets this year? I feel like nobody did. Haley did. I made her fill out a bracket and she picked Alabama somehow. I have no idea how she picked Alabama to get as far as they did, but they finally lost last night. She was depressed after that. <laughs> but in the course of watching March Madness, um, I see all these coaches, like I think of Don Staley who's going for the championship today, right? 
and I think of Gino Ariyama. I think of all these coaches. I think of Coach K and historically who, who just seem to always know the right thing or they have this like right game plan and they feel like these sages of wisdom that whether it's any coaching opportunity that you see or anything like that, they just seem to know what's the right thing to do in the right time. They have these like missions or they have these like aphorisms or sayings or things that they really hold to and that they're just, it just seems like, wow, they've got it all figured out. They've got it all together. They seem to know exactly the right thing to do and the right way to hold to their mission and all that. And a lot of times for me, I still feel like I'm struggling to figure out, well, what is that? What is those things for me? How do I become someone who I feel like is in that same space? And so those are the questions that I often wrestle with when I'm thinking about those things. And so today, what we're going to be looking at, what we're gonna, the story we're going to be looking at and the character that we're going to be looking at is the character of Moses. As we, we read the, the story today, we're going to be looking at the character of Moses and seeing some of his own questions, trying to find and follow what God is up to and what God has called him to in his mission. We're going to be trying to take a look at Moses. And so Moses, if we want to give a little background to who Moses is, as we read about in that story, uh, Moses is someone who grew up in Egypt. He was in that oppressive system in Egypt that had realized that there was a threat to their own power. And so they tried to annihilate different people groups and, and cut people off, especially by killing children in order to prevent that from happening, a horrible, horrific act of trying to protect and preserve their own power at the expense of other people. I wonder if you've ever heard of kingdoms or places like that in the world before. It seems to be a common place, but it serves as like a, a, a sort of paradigm for us to look at. And so in that spot, Moses is saved, right? Moses ends up being saved through the river that his mother puts him in. He ends up growing up in the household of Egypt while also still being able to be raised and nurtured by his Hebrew mother. It's an incredible story of sort of a, a both and. He, he's Egyptian, but he's also Hebrew in a different way. And so as we look at that part, he ends up deciding to, at one day he sees his fellow Hebrew being killed, or not being killed, being uh, hurt and being beaten by an Egyptian. And so he decides to kill that Egyptian. He says, let me, let me take things in my hand, let me do this. And maybe, I don't know, there's no specific on this, but maybe speculating that perhaps that, the, that Hebrew folks would maybe see him and identify with him or be thankful or something like that. And the next day he comes back, sees two Hebrews quarreling with each other, two of his own people, and says, hey, what are you doing? And they said, what, are you going to kill us like you did that Egyptian? A deep call, a deep sort of, you're, you're still not one of us, right? Like there, there's like this sense in which he, he still feels rejected in that point. And then he starts to think, oh, it's been heard, it's been found out about, so let me flee, let me get out of here, let me become a fugitive who runs away from, from this place so that I can live. Because Pharaoh hears about it. And so uh, the map that we have here just tries to give you a little context to show you where he goes and how far he goes. He flees to a place called Midian. Um, and in that place called Midian, it's a, different, it's, a, it's a little distance away. But he spends what we find to be 40 years of time in Midian. He, he spends 40 years in the shepherding. And what we, how we found that and where we determined that from, and maybe we're not able to get the slide up at this moment. That's okay. You can, you can just follow me. Just know it's a little bit of a different, different area. But he spends 40 years of time there. We learned that from the book of Acts. If you're looking in Exodus, you might be looking, how did he find out the exact amount of time? Actually, in the book of Acts, Stephen is telling the story, and he finds out how long he's been there. And so he flees, he runs away, and he spends 40 years. Now, Picture that just, just as we're entering this story. 40 years is not just a short amount of time, right? So he has committed a murder in this space. He has fleed. He's become an, an exile. He's ran away, and he finds a place of actually maybe home or comfort. He finds his wife there. He, he serves underneath his, his wife's father, Jethro. And in that space, he becomes someone who is able to just be shepherding for 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert. And I don't know about you, I might think my life, that's my life now. This is how this is going to go for the rest of my life. I've got that sort of thing taken care of. But in the middle of this, God decides it's time to act. It's interesting that NLT brings out this idea that it's specifically like time. Like God knows that it's, this is the right time to act. This is the time that I am going to bring about a mission and a purpose that I think needs to happen. And so he goes to Moses and he reveals himself to Moses in the classic burning bush situation that most of us have heard at many different points throughout our life. This amazing burning bush, this, this marvel, this thing. And it's in a moment of God's revelation of himself to Moses that we see a mission handed out 
as well as the how-to on how to accomplish that mission. So today we're talking about a mission being given and then a mission handed out. So the first thing that truth that we want to really highlight on, that we want to talk about, that we'll be able to see explained in this passage is first this, we are called to be on mission. Each and every single one of us, we are called to be on mission. God, and, and, and this is one of the things I find attractive about faith and Christianity, especially Christianity, a God who actually chooses to be involved in his world, to love his world, is that we have been given a mission. God has given you and me mission to be able to live. It's, it's purposeful. We're not here just spiraling around wondering what we're doing, but you and me have actually been given missions in this world. Now, there's a general mission that we have all been given, right? So we have been given through things like the Great Commission that we see in the book of Matthew. We see that God has called us on mission to be kingdom image bearers in this world. What that means in, in complex is to be like Christ in this world, to share Christ's love, to be people who share who Christ is in this world. That is a mission that no matter what else goes on in your life, a, mat a matter of the midst of the swirling, the what do I do, and is this exactly what I'm supposed to do, and God, what am I, what's my exact mission? That's a mission that you don't have to worry about. You get to know that God has called you specifically, and all of us as a community, to be on mission in this world, to be like Christ, and to share Christ's love into this world. But now for Moses here, he gets a very, very, very specific mission. I think that sometimes we have, we both, we all have moments where there might be the general mission and there might be a very specific mission that God has put us on. And so God comes in, verses ten, in verse 10 of chapter 3 and he delivers a specific mission to Moses. He says, I am a deliverer and I'm sending you to Pharaoh to lead my people out of Egypt. Now, one thing I want to note about the specific mission that's given, right? God has given a mission to Moses, and where and what context does this mission come about? It comes out when he is in God's presence. So the mission comes out when he is in God's presence. If you remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Una was preaching about uh, the mission of Jesus, right? And she talked a lot about how there was so much going on. How is he to know he spent time in the Lord's presence. He would get away to places and he would find himself with the Lord. And in those places, he was able to return to center almost. He was able to return to clarity on what is my mission? Where is it? And it's through the presence of God, through choosing to spend time with God and through choosing to understand his presence there, he's able to get that. And so I think one important thing about our mission that we should know is that the mission of God often comes through the presence of God. And when we are spending ourselves in the presence of God. But one interesting thing about this that I think is that it comes about while he was going about his day. So Moses wasn't carving out his time to be with God. Moses was on his own. He was in a place of sort of isolation. He was in a place where he was able to be kind of set apart, a solitary place where God could work in him. But when God chose to act in his miraculous intervention way where he said, I have a specific moment for you. It was a moment that he could not avoid. He was invited into. God specifically showed up and said, I have something for you to do. I have something for you to do. It came about while he was going about his day. It interrupted a thing that he was already doing. Sometimes we think that we have to sit in prayer for a certain amount of hours or a certain amount of time for God to show up, for him to reveal to us specific missions that he might have for us. But if God has a specific mission for you, he shows up and he initiates with you. He will interrupt you. He will bring about that thing in a way that is remarkable and in a way that says, I have called you. I am showing up in you in this way. God shows up to Moses in a way directly here. And something else that I think was interesting is, like I said, he's going about his day, but Moses had been 40 years a shepherd in this place. And he had not missed God's mission. That was part of perhaps his formation to become the person he needed to be. It, it, it doesn't say God was pestering him for 40 years to do this specific thing. And he kept saying, no, 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 in that moment. 40 years in the wilderness, being faithful as a shepherd may have actually been what he was supposed to do in that time. 
God had called him at a specific time. And so sometimes I think we can put all this pressure on ourselves and the world to get this right one moment, to every moment have this burning bush experience where God shows up in the burning bush. And not every moment is a burning bush. Sometimes faithfulness to God and faithfulness to what God is calling you to is that until the burning bush happens, you are faithful with the stewardship of what you have been given. You have been faithful and you are choosing to be faithful in that time where if everything was a burning bush moment, it would almost be kind of like overwhelming all the time for us as humans, right? And that doesn't mean burning bush moments don't happen, but we don't have to manipulate them or force them into being. God gives us burning bush moments in his time, in his way, in his specific choice to, and he reveals them to us. And so if you're in a moment where you sometimes feel that spiraling thing of like, what's my mission? What's my mission? I feel like I'm supposed to have a mission. I need to have a mission because people say I'm supposed to have a mission. And all this sort of stuff, we're supposed to have a mission. Perhaps actually your mission is to be faithful with where you are. And to wait on the Lord's revelation to show you those things because he will, because he loves you, because he's not trying to confuse you. But in the faithfulness of where you are and what God has for you, Choosing to be faithful in those places because sometimes there is not always the burning bush moment at every moment. And that's okay. But God does reveal through his presence our mission. He, th he revealed it in Jesus' presence with us in earth that he came to, to, to have us make disciples of all nations, to love folks, to bring about unity. And so those things are things we can always accomplish. But sometimes he does provide the specific. God does not liberate without also calling human agents to the task of liberation. So when God gives this mission, and when God chooses to provide liberation, he chooses to provide love, he is going to choose to work through you and me. That's why we have mission, is because we don't just rely on God. God actually uses us and chooses us and we rely on God to give us the strength as well to be participants in bringing about God's liberation on this earth and so a mission is given a mission is given to Moses Moses gets a specific mission we all have perhaps specific missions that we might have but we also have these general missions that there is a mission that God has and when God has that he delivers it to us. But the question that comes up for Moses is maybe some of the ones that we can wrestle with a lot. Because Moses' response is not, um, so in the book, I always find, I find it funny in the book, uh, the children's book that we read, because it says, so Moses went after God revealed to him what he was supposed to do in the bush. And I'm like, yeah. It took a little bit, though. There's some, there's some in between, and so we want to uncover a little bit about what, the, what happened between the God says and so Moses went here to be able to, to decipher that a little bit. And so the way that God chooses to help accomplish and flesh out the idea of what is your mission, what, how do I accomplish this mission, is this. To accomplish God's mission, God asks, what is in your hand? To accomplish God's mission... God asks, what is in your hand? And this happens with Moses in this interaction in a couple different ways. One, indirectly. There's a first part where God is, and Moses is, is saying, who am I? In response to this mission, God's given this mission. He said, I want you to go. I want you to be the person who goes to speak to Pharaoh. I want you to be the one who goes. And he says, who am I to be the one to do this? Don't you know me? Like, don't you know my, my story? Like, I, I know I was saved, but that's cool. But, like, I murdered someone, and I'm, I'm like, a, an exile right now. I'm a fugitive. I'm someone who's running away because I, I murdered someone. And, and how am I supposed to go back? To, and so the Egyptians hate me right now, right? That, they've got a name out for me that, that says, if you see this person again, you better, better call someone because, because I, I did this. And so they're on the lookout for me. But even my own people, the Hebrew folks who... Who, who hear of me, the last time I was there, they rejected me. Even when I tried to do something that would help out my Hebrew, Hebrew people, they, they, they sort of like ran it back in my face. They didn't hold me up. They didn't say I was one of them. In so I have to run. I have to get out of here. And so who am I? Don't you know my story? Don't you know that I'm not someone worth it? 
And I wonder how many of us ask those questions ourselves, right? Where we ask the question, who am I? God, you've given me this mission or you've given me this, this thing, whether it's specific or general, either way, who am I? Who, could, who, who are you looking at? Don't you know my story, my history, my context? Fill in the blank of whichever place you might have to say, who am I? And God's response to who am I is not an affirmation of Moses. It doesn't say, oh, yeah, well, you know, all these things. But he actually says, it's not about who you are. It's I will be with you. I'm the God of all the ancestors. He specifically calls out this, this heritage, this lineage, this ancestry that he's been part of. And he says, remember all the ways I've showed up for them? I show up for you in the same way. I have not abandoned you. I have not forsaken you. But I will show up for you. And I am with you. Don't you remember Abraham was all these terrible things? We like to talk about these great things that he was. But he was a liar. He was doing all sorts of different things. Jacob was known. His name means deceiver. Like, translates to deceiver. So when we say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, laugh. Isaac's name means laugh because they laughed at the idea that he would be born. So every time we hear this phrase, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we hear the father of many. Then we hear laugh. Then we hear deceiver. Where do you find yourself in the middle of that heritage? You might find yourself in there. And so whether you feel like you're the deceiver, you feel like you're the father of many, or you feel like you're just laughing along with it, you are still God's and you are part of that people. And so whatever story it is that you bring to the table, God is the one who's with you, not, not you. It's not just what you can do. It's what God can do in and through you because he is with you. And he can redeem your story. Another thing that Moses says, another place where Moses is indirectly like, uh, I don't know, God, uh, maybe not me, is he shares his inadequacies, his inabilities, and his weaknesses. He says, I, God, you know, I'm not like that guy who talks very well. I can't talk that much. Uh, my mouth gets all messed up or something like that. And, and God specifically says, who makes the mouth? I will be with you. And I think what's interesting is that God uses the weakness. He uses the perceived weakness. So God can use both your strengths and your weaknesses to help you accomplish the mission. And it's an interesting thing that I, I think about a little bit because I want to share, I mean, he points out what is not in his hand. What is not in his hand. It's almost like when we compare to God, when God calls us to a mission and, and we say, well, but I'm not like that. If I could sing then I could do this mission, right? Like the choir does to transform people through, through worship. If I could do this, if I could do this. So maybe Moses is saying, if I could talk well, then I could maybe get this to be going on. How many times do you look at other people and say, if I could only be like them, God, then maybe I could accomplish the mission that you've given me. When God is saying, no, I've actually called you because my power is made manifest in weakness and I will choose to use you to bring about glory. And so one of the examples that I think is helpful for us to see how God might use weakness is this. Miss Jackie Hunt, if you remember her message from um, February, she preached in February. If you haven't, go take a look at it. It's really amazing. She talks about what it means to exit to serve. And she talked about how decades ago, decades ago, she was someone who was going through um, uh, uh, coming out of incarceration and having addiction needs. And so she knew what she needed to do was to stay sober. That is the one thing she knew that she could do in that moment. Now, did she choose to make, or t so if she knew she needed that, right, her weakness was staying sober. She chose to say, okay, in order to stay sober, I need people. I need community. I need people around me to love me and support. So what she did is she went to Pastor G and she said, hey, can I start ministries where we spend time with each other? where we create fellowship times with each other, where we have fun, where we, we spend time. That was a ministry that lasted for a long time where many people were able to find the benefit of being able to have time and community and space and, and, and all of that with each other. What she didn't try to do was to try and say, okay, I need to stay sober, so let me help figure out how everyone else can stay sober. What she said is, I'm actually in the midst of this sober issue, feeling lonely, I'm struggling, I'm needing people to show up for me, and so let me help be a part of the process. Let me create, let me show 
God my weakness and let God transform it to be a place where other people can find liberation as well, where other people can find freedom, where other people are able to do that as well. And so sometimes God will use our weaknesses, the very things that we find, maybe because something in our hand might actually be loneliness. It might be pain. It might be something we've gone through and struggled through where we are actually struggling with something that is actually in our hand. And we can, be, we can allow that to be transferred over to God to be used so that God is able to bring about stuff for other, bring about liberation for other people. And then eventually Moses just says, God send anyone else. I just don't want to do it. We don't know exactly why, right? Was it because was it, was it of fear? Was it because of obstinance? Was it just, I just don't want to do it. I'm having a good life here in, in Midian. I don't really want that to be disrupted. And what God also shares in the midst of this mission is that he'll give support. He specifically, he gets angry with Moses. He's like, ah, Moses, come on. But he provides a way. He provides a support. He provides a person. He provides Aaron who is able to go with him, who's able to be with him. And interestingly enough, not only does he do that, but right afterwards, he goes to tell his father-in-law, I think I'm supposed to go. And Jethro's like, cool, see ya. Like, I, I don't know, I find that odd that, you know, he's been faithful, he's, he's taken his daughter, and, and Jethro's just like, all right, sure, yeah, if God says it, go ahead. In some ways, God provides more support for Moses. That after, he doesn't give that way out of like, well, well I would, God, but my, you know my father-in-law. Uh, he's, uh, he's some, no, he, he provides that way. And then in fact, later his own wife does a, now it's a crazy, crazy story. I was talking with sister Kim about this passage later, uh, right after, um, this, his wife Zipporah does an amazing act. Now, I don't fully understand the full details of it. If you've ever seen it, it involves like, I don't know, just a, a, a knife, a circumcision with, with also, it's just very odd. It's one of those odd stories in the Bible, but what we do know from that story is that God uses his wife Zipporah to continue this process, to continue this liberation, to continue this mission that God has. And so God will provide and continues to provide support even when we are feeling alone, obstinate, or fearful to accomplish his mission. God has given you a mission, and he will help you accomplish that mission. Now, directly... We've talked about some of the indirect things about what's in your hand because uh, God's essentially telling him, use what's in your hand. And he's saying, I don't know, uh, my experience, eh, that's in your hand and I'm actually going to use it. Oh, I don't, I'm afraid. Uh, I, it's in your hand is relationships that I've given you that are going to help you accomplish God's task. He asked this indirectly, but then directly we have what becomes the phrase that, that centers this whole series, which is this. Moses asked, what if they won't believe or listen to me? What if they won't believe or listen to me? And God asks, what's that in your hand? Now, I may or may not have something over here. I've got a shepherd's staff. Now, some of you who've been around a while, you might be saying to yourself, Tyler, again with the shepherd's staff? We've seen it before. We know you own a shepherd's staff. For those of you who don't know, I own a shepherd's staff. Uh, <laughs> I bought it in particular because Psalm 23 was really meaningful to me, and it, it, it's really helpful for me to have a physical object that helps to represent God's faithfulness to me. But it also can be used as a prop for a sermon, so we're going to use it, right? So when God asks what's in your hand to help accomplish the mission and to help people know that God is real, I find it so significant because when you think about it, oftentimes when we're trying to figure out what God's will for us is, right? Or what God wants us to do, or the specific things that he has for us. We're often in this mindset where everything else in our life goes blank, and we're like, okay, God, let me just help me figure it out. Whatever it is, it's not with me. It's like we come with this deficit mentality where we think that it can't be something that we already have. It's like when we're looking, um, I don't know how many of you ever are uh, looking through your phone, and you're looking everywhere, and so you've got it. You're, you're like, oh, where's my phone? Where's my phone? And let me call my wife. She might know where it is. Excuse me. <laughs> and it's right in your hand the whole time. Now, I know I've gotten that because I've actually, I've heard stories about some of you with that. But God's 
will for you and his mission for you and how to fulfill God's mission is not this thing that we always have to be on search for like it doesn't exist in the world, like we have to create it out of thin air. Oftentimes when God is trying to help us understand our mission, he is asking what is in your hand? What do you already have? What is there? What is it that is in? And, and interestingly enough, Mo, what's in Moses' hand is obvious. It's familiar. Like I imagine he looks at the staff and knows where the different knots have been from his experience, from his life. It's felt familiar. It's in his hand. He knows what it is because he's been walking with it every day. It's not something that when God tells him, you need to accomplish your mission. So go find this thing that is unfamiliar to you. It's God has been giving him this and having him walk with it for 40 years. That would become the sign and the wonder to people that would make them say, what it is. Um, yeah, the will of God can sometimes feel mysterious, elusive. I think like you're losing your phone and it's right in your hand and you're trying to find it. But, but God often asks us when we have a mission to accomplish, what is it that is in your hand? What is it God has given you? What is it that's familiar and what places can I use? And that's what I think sticks out too about the idea of weakness, right? Sometimes our weaknesses and our places of failure have often been places that feel familiar to us. They feel like they've been around all the time. You know God can actually use that. That place that continually we get stuck in, that feels so familiar. God actually can and wants to use that to bring others life. All right, it didn't become a snake. I promise you, it didn't become a snake. I was really worried that it might at some point. I don't know. I don't know, but we got through with that. So ultimately, what happens with these things that are familiar, these things that are in our hand, God takes what's in our hand, and he transforms it to accomplish his mission in the world. Sometimes I think we... Notice, we, we might even be able to get to the point where we notice what's in our hand. We say, okay, okay. And then we're still like we're trying to make it happen. It's like we have to be the ones that make the thing happen when in reality God is looking at the thing in your hand and saying it's not because it's in your hand that it has power. It's because I am present in you and I am present to transform it into a place where there is able to be impact. The staff transforms through God's power and becomes a sign to others of God's appearance and commissioning. God has put you in places where you will use what is in your hand and because of his power, not you, but because of his power in and through you to transform it, people will look at you and say, there must be a God. People will look, as Pastor talks about this vision of all the signs where people, where he talks about, he, he sensed that this would be a place where people will shake their heads and say, there must be a God. It's because, it's not because of you and me individually. It's because God is working through us and transforming us. We are about transformation here. And so we enter to worship, and when we enter to worship, we become transformed into people who exit to serve. We become transformed into people who love and care about other people, who show up in our communities, who care, who provide Christ in our spaces, in every space that we find ourselves. And so the staff, is the thing that makes people shake their heads because it's what becomes transformed. It's not what's in your hand itself that will be assigned to others. It's what God will do with it. And so what we have to do is when we identify those places in our hands, when we identify places that we have something in our hands, and I don't know what it might be for you that you begin to think about and begin to pray and consider what is it that God has given me? What is it that I have in my hand that God might use to be transformed? It comes, we have to answer God's question of what's in our hand, and then we have to open up our hands. Not just hold on to it still, but open it up. Surrender and give it to God so that he can transform it and use it to show his miraculous signs of glory, that he can use it to show people throughout the world, whether they are people who, um, who know God or people who are obstinate to God, 
There was a lot of no and resistance from Moses, but eventually he came to the point where he could not fight it any longer. I will recognize that God has power. And so no matter what place you face, whatever place you come up against, whatever place that you're sabotaged by in this world, this, this place that, that comes against the light that you are shining, that comes against the places of using what is in your hand, that is something that we know happens. But as you continue to allow those places to be transformed, as you continue to offer them, as you continue to surrender them in obedience and say, God, take this thing and continue to transform it into a place that can impact this world, I promise you God has the power to do it. And it will be a sign of glory and wonder to him that will transform people to shake their heads and say there must be a God. When we think about exit to serve at this church, we talk about enter to worship, exit to serve every week. I just want to share some highlights of maybe what this looks like um, and, and maybe what this could look like in your life or in lives of people that we've seen. We talk about exit to serve, and one person who I think embodied this incredibly well was Miss Lurley Richardson. For those of you who um, are unaware, so Miss Lurley Richardson was a long, long, long time congregant here at Fountain of Life. Um, Stuff has happened really quickly to the point where she actually just passed um, a couple weeks ago. That might actually be news to some of you because we haven't had the ability to share it as a congregation yet. Um, she, if you're newer as well, she was here for a long, long time and then ever since COVID hasn't had the ability to be with us. But she was someone who uh, was deeply faithful here in our community. Um, I remember first meeting her. She would serve the Meet, Your Church, meet the Church Home, Meet the G's meeting um, with Aunt Margaret. Um, and I remember seeing her there, and she was so faithful in, in serving. And one of the words, I got to go to her memorial service uh, about a week and a half ago. She just had her memorial service, and it was an absolutely beautiful service. Um, it was something that her life testified through that service. I think it was very clear. And we had a lot of Fountain of Life people there who were there to talk about her. And one of the words that first comes up with her is that she was quiet. For those of you who may know her, you may have seen or experienced that. She was someone who, when you'd come in on Sunday, she was so, so quiet. Not someone who's at the front, not someone who's speaking all the time, not someone who's doing all that, but she was someone who was quiet, but she was someone of deep, deep faith. As one of the people I talked to this week who talked to me about her said she had a well-worn Bible, and she was always helping with hospitality and, and showing up and ushering and being someone who would show up all the time consistently in our space. But she did not just enter to worship, she exit to serve. And in her exiting to serve, one of the things that she did as uh, someone in our community is she worked for the city of Madison for decades. And she also worked as an election official, helping uh, people with elections. And she would use all of these different places there. And because of her deep inner knowledge of the city, she knew tons of things about our city, especially the system and the way things work in our city that oftentimes people didn't know about. In fact, as I talked to one of the people who knew her, talked about a lot of times, she would go out of her way and intentionally work to help black folks know about opportunities in the city, things in the city that they may not be aware of or programs that they may not be aware of to specifically help with what they're going through, resources that were available, but that maybe for one reason or another or systemic injustice would allow to be the case, unaware of unable to access, and she would choose to show up and to make things known, places of liberty, places of life, places of transformation for people to access it. And what I heard described is she wouldn't embarrass others. She wouldn't come up in front of people. Probably no one knew except for the people that she'd go to because she's so quiet. She would find them, and she would say, hey, I've heard about what's going on. Can I talk to you? She would go up and talk to them, and she'd say, hey, I heard about that situation. Can I provide some, some insight? Can I talk to someone for you? I'm going to go find some way to help you out. I'm going to find some way to provide for you. I'm going to find some way to help make a difference into places where I've heard people talk about and describe literally changed their life. Provided ways and provided shelter, provided food, provided all sorts of things that couldn't possibly be calculated. She said, I am someone on mission for God in this world. And God has given me capacity. He has given me knowledge. He has given this position so that I can choose to exit to serve, to let that be transformed, to let this thing in my hand, this position, this job I have be transformed to benefit others. 
and to be a place of providing those things for others. One of the other things that was talked about her um, is she was someone who would write cards. You hear this on here, you hear people who are saying they got cards from Miss Lurley. From what I understand, Miss Lurley, uh, even at her, her memorial service, they said in her house they would find stacks and stacks and stacks of cards, like in her couch, in like random places where she would always have a card available and ready at any moment to write to people. They found stamps everywhere and everywhere because what she would do is she said, I love writing and I love encouraging people or writing to people, and so I'm just going to choose to write to anyone and everyone for whatever reason I can. One of the folks who talked about her told me that, um, so Foster's, if you are unaware, is the uh, black-owned um, uh, funeral home in Madison. And what she would do is that she would get a list. She would go on their website and find every single family or person who passed and that they performed a memorial service for, and she would write a card to that family. Every single one to write and say, God loves you, I'm here, or God loves you, I'm sorry for your loss. That's an example of someone who, she was quiet, she didn't need to be up front, she could be her personality right, but her life testifies to taking what was in her hand and saying, Lord, do with this what you will, and letting it transform into places of hope, encouragement, love, and transformation for other people. That's an example of someone who used what was in their hand. I think of, I think of other people I know. I think of a store manager who considers himself the pastor of the grocery store, who choose to relate to employees going through depression, life events, who chooses to in the middle of a world that's very, um, all about numbers and all about performance, chooses to say, I actually care about you, not what you represent. I think about folks who are incarcerated, who have come out of incarceration. If you don't know, we have uh, a program at Nehemiah called um, our reentry program, and it's full of folks who have gone through incarceration and have stories and things to tell of their stories who are choosing to say, I'm going to let my experiences be a place of hope and light. I'm going to let them be transformed into a place that points people to a place of hope. I think of people and families. I think of someone who's got a family of people who maybe aren't believers or people who are struggling, who their presence and their love and their consistency with those folks is a way of exiting and using what's in their hand. My family's in my hand. Let me love my family. I think about a parent who is faithfully present with their child and when their child is going through really deep pain and really deep difficulty and choosing to offer that to God and said, say, let me love this child through everything I possibly can in this moment. I think about a parent who is going through their own pain, who is incredibly overwhelmed and in place of difficulty and is going through so many struggles, but in the middle of that pain has children and wants to communicate to these children that God loves them through their presence and their choice to love them in that moment. I think about that parent who says, what's in my hand is my children. I think about a volunteer at a local shelter, a uh, homeless organization uh, that provides shelter for people who are going through homelessness who said, I really care about the fact that our city is struggling to provide affordable housing to anybody. And who said, you know what, I don't know how to fix all of that, but I know that people need a warm meal on Thursday mornings, and I can make eggs. Could I come and make warm eggs, make over 150 eggs for people in the community? a week just by choosing to say, that's in my hand. I can do that. I think about a middle school teacher who uh, does an amazing job of doing one-time volunteer, er, volunteering in a ministry here at church. And they also uh, do volunteer, they're part of a community here at church, but where they really find where they, they come alive 
is in their position as a middle school teacher, where they're able to equip and educate people and children in this community who they deeply care for and impact and feel that God has placed them in that space in particular because they have a knowledge and experience of education, working with children, and God uses them. Or they say, God, this is in my hand. Transform it. Make it a place for liberation for others. Make it a place where your love comes through with other people. And I think about people who are going through deep times of weakness, deep times of pain, deep times of hurt, who what they have to offer in this moment may not be something as easy to define as a resource, but maybe it's pain. Maybe it's a place of loneliness. Maybe it's a place of darkness that they're, they're working through. And, and they, they simply can offer it to Lord and say, Lord, somehow transform this into a place that your glory gets the, the name of it that helps liberate other people, that helps other people find freedom in you and helps me find freedom in you as well. Our mission as individuals and as a church, as people, is to be Christ followers. You may have been given a specific mission, and that's wonderful. You may have a general mission, which we all know is to follow Christ and to bring Christ's love into this world. In either case, the question about how to accomplish that is this. What's in your hand? What is it that God has given you or that you find yourself in? How might you offer that up and surrender to transform, to say, God, take this and make this something about your glory? When I opened up this morning uh, and I talked a little bit about the March Madness coaches, I did a little research on what makes them special or what makes them what they talk about. And they don't talk about, I just was born with this, or I know this, or I just have this omniscient sense of what it is. Because they went through a lot of failure. They went through a lot of deep experiences that were hard. They went through places where they didn't know how to do it. And through failure, they were able to find ways forward. They, through, through using what was in their hand and their team in difficult moments and working it out, they were able to find places of excellence, places where they're able to figure out what their mission was and to really hold to it. Today, um, don't discount your experiences. Don't discount the places that God has put on you. Don't discount what God has given and put in your hand. Today, our question is going to be, can you identify those places? Pray for God's leading in mission and, and starting, like, as we say here, pray, praying that, that God would really help to reveal, like we talked about in, in those times of um, where, where mission comes out in the presence of God. Mission really can come out in the presence of God, and that can come interrupting your day, or it can come when you're on your feet, or when you're on your knees, praying to Jesus, that God would reveal that mission. That in revealing that mission, that you would identify those things in your hand that we talked about. What are some experiences? What are some resources? What are some, some things that you have to offer that God can transform? Next up, we have, I forgot what was on the PowerPoint specifically. So yes, these experiences, resources, skills, talents, weaknesses, contexts, and familiar stuff. And then from there, opening your hands to God as we mentioned, giving these things and praying for his transformation. Asking God with those things that you open up in your hand to say, would you please take this and transform it in your own way? It might take 40 years in the shepherding wilderness to do it, but do it. And then be curious and take steps of faith. I think sometimes when we've offered something to God, we still might wait and we, we might not make steps when later on in Exodus, Moses is actually at the part where the parting of the Red Sea, where he's like, okay, God, all right, everybody, don't, don't do anything. Just be still, and the Lord's going to move. 
And God looks at him and he says, why are you calling out to me? Take the staff. That's in your hand. It's the miraculous sign of God's glory. Use it. And so sometimes we might need to take that step where if we've offered something to God to transform it, to help with it, we can be curious and observe and say, okay, God, what are you doing in that space now? And maybe take those steps to begin to pursue that transformation in faith. In addition, what we want to do to help us kind of seal this and to help us have an experiential way of, of kind of letting this sit with us is it's first Sunday, and what we do is we do communion as well. And Jesus took what was in his hand. God had given a mission to Jesus. God had given Jesus a call and a space to be faithful. And Jesus took the love he had for us, and he chose to come to us. He chose to give his life. He chose to give what was in his hand, which was a perfect sacrifice of who he was because he loved us and wants us to have freedom. And he also, on that night he was betrayed, took what was in his hand. He took the bread and the cup an, and, and he, he showed it to his disciples and he said, do this in memory of me and and so communion and some of our folks for who, wanna, who are going to be helping perform communion or help, help set up communion can start to come up here and get in, get in place. Communion is actually an act of surrender in itself. We talked about taking what was in our hand and surrendering it to God and letting him transform it. Communion is actually an act of surrender in itself because when we come to the communion table, we have to say to whatever it is that we have in our hand, I give it up to receive the death and resurrection of Christ. I give it up so that I can receive God's blood, God's body. And because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are able to experience transformation in our lives. Because God transformed from a place of death to a place of life, we are able to follow Jesus today and we are able to be transformed we see that the power that brought Jesus to life lives in us today the power that changed the staff the power that as God said what is in your hand that could transform it that power is able to transform you and I today and so as we take communion we recognize that communion is an experiential moment it's something that is tangible something God gave us as a sign as a tangible moment for us to recognize and understand that God's grace is with us and that God's grace has the power to transform, that he loves us, where we declare our belief in the Lord's death and resurrection. We partake of the body of Christ as the body of Christ, together remembering and declaring victory and the truth of the God's resur of gospel's resurrection power. And we participate in the mystery of God's grace. So at Fountain of Life, we enter to worship and we exit to serve. Even as we come up today, we might think about how we enter to worship God. We walk up worshiping God. We walk up thanking God for what he has done for us, for his participation in our lives by giving himself. And then we take it and we exit to serve transformed people who are transformed to, to be what God has called us to be. At Fountain of Life, all Christians are welcome at, our t at the Lord's table. If you are someone who identifies Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you identify as Christ resurrected, you are welcome to come. And for children, if, if you're not at an age where if your parents, if, if parents or um, adults are at an age where they don't feel their children able to, we would still love for children to come up because we give them a blessing. And we bless them and we say, we, we believe that God is using you and can use you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. And so our servers are up here. What you'll be able to do is, as the music goes, you'll be able to, to come up, to walk up, to, to grab the communion elements. Go back and take them to your seat. We're all going to take them together. And um, yeah, you'll be able to do that. You'll get anointed first. You'll grab that and head back to your seats as we have this time. So take this time and, and come. Come expecting, knowing that God is a transformative.
and we do have gluten-free right in the center as well if, if that's needed. one of those who she sent many cards to and blessed me in such a beautiful way. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and take the breath. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you 
proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's go ahead and take your cup. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for being a God who transforms, for being a God who takes what's in our hand, those things that we come and we just offer as an offer of sacrifice, an offer and say, God, use me. And that you do, God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to know what it is that your mission is for us and that we would be able to respond, Lord Jesus. God, I, we thank you that you have made us a body of believers who come together, who love each other, and Lord, that you would be in transformation in that process. God, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to have one more opportunity to respond before we do a few other things at the end here. This is our time that if you have tithes or offerings, you're more than welcome to come up here and put them in the basket. If this is a time where you need to respond personally to the message today, to God's invitation to the table, to God's invitation for you to embrace his mission, to say what's in your hand and to offer it we're going to have some, some prayer team members down here just to be able to respond. This is a time where, as you worship, may you be able to, to offer up what is in your hand to the Lord that he might transform it. After we're done with worship, we'll come back up and we'll have just a couple other things before we close. Join together. Let's join together in the words of this familiar song. I surrender all as we consider what we have in our hands. Let's just surrender that to the Lord.
Lord Jesus, we we thank you. God, we thank you that you are a God who who meets each and every one of us in every place that we find ourselves. God, that you see what is in our hand. You see what's in our hand and you choose to use us anyway. You choose to use what is in our hand to bring about transformation. And you transform those things that are in our hand, not just for ourselves, but Lord Jesus, you transform them so that you may gain glory by being by showing life and liberation and freedom for other people, God. We thank you that you are a God who loves, who brings rescue, who brings freedom, who brings places of liberty, God. We pray that as we continue today that we would just know deep in our spirits that you take what it is that we offer and you can transform it into things that are unheard of, things that make people shake their heads and say there must be a God. So that I pray these blessings over us And as we continue in worship, Lord Jesus, today, I just pray you'd you'd fill us deeply with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, um, we have um, two other things that we typically do on first Sundays. They they don't take too long, but I just um, want to bring our attention to those before we close out today. This is an exciting part, especially for those of you who may be considering joining Fountain of Life at some point, um, is that we do, first off, we do something where we introduce people who are joining our church home on first Sundays. Um, And so today we had two individuals. One wasn't able to make it today due to they got sick, but we have another individual who we are introducing in front of our church today who is making Fountain of Life their church home. And that person is Sister Karen Monroe. Sister Karen, you want to come up? All right, so Sister Karen, we always ask for three questions that people can fill out to get to know people better. And so Sister Karen, we asked her what makes Fountain of Life feel like home to her. And she said Fountain of Life feels like home because it's the same goals where home is and and where the the same goals home is where the heart is. She feels like she feels the love when she comes to Fountain of Life. Uh, something, Something she's passionate about is that she's passionate about helping people. She enjoys being able to help her family, friends, and sometimes even strangers, and is super grateful and honored to be able to help those whoever she can, whenever she can. And the third place is where's the primary place she exits to serve every day? She says her career. She's responsible for the care of elderly folks and and people making sure there are great people there to take care for them, take care of them and get them to things that they need on a daily basis. Also with her family, her children, her grandchildren, she knows when they need her giving love, time, and care. She knows that she's an influence for God's kingdom in those places when she does that. That sounds like someone who's using what's in their hand. So Sister Karen, we just want to pray a quick prayer of blessing over you. Um, If some of the pastoral team members or any, any prayer team members want to come up in front here just to lay hands on Sister Karen, we want to pray a blessing for her and, and glad that she's joining Fountain of Life. Lord Jesus, I pray your blessings over Sister Karen. Lord, we are so thankful that she is choosing Fountain of Life to be a place where she can find roots and where she can find a place in a family and a community that will choose to love her, that will choose to uphold her, Lord, where she can choose to, to find place and in, in, in space here at Fountain of Life. Lord, we pray your blessings on her. Lord, we pray your blessings on her family as she talks about children and grandchildren and people who, who she exits to serve every day by choosing to, to pour into in love. We thank you for her and your call to her. We pray that as she would take that as well as uh, the, the care that she gives for folks who are elders, Lord, we pray that you would use what's in her hand, Lord Jesus be transformed, Lord. I pray your blessings on her. I pray that she would know you deeper and more each and every day, that places and dreams that maybe felt like they were too far gone, that they would be resurrected. I pray for places in her life that she is is feeling less than adequate in, Lord, that she would know that you have got her, that you walk with her, that you care about her, that you see her, and that you uplift her, Lord. I pray your blessings on her and that as she enters to worship here at Fountain of Life, that she would exit to serve, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, so that is, uh, that's for today. We are so thankful that Sister Karen is joining our community and our family. Uh, it's just wonderful. And um, we also just have a few bragging rights to share this Sunday. So it is our April bragging rights, and we want to share a few things. The first of which is Dr. Mary Gill. Ah. So if you are unaware or if you are looking for a nice Sunday afternoon activity, uh, her work is displayed in Gallery 2 of the Overture Center currently until Sunday, June 9th. Um, and her gallery is called Color Play. And her colorful work interprets the magic of the world in which she lives. Her paintings and collages address the human experience from her Car Caribbean perspective. Um, and big thing to also mark on your calendar, she is also doing an artist talk on Sunday, April 28th. Sunday, April 28th at 4.30 p.m. in Gallery 2. You can find more about this on our website, but she's going to dis discuss her life and paintings in light of her American experience through the lens of growing up in Trinidad. So you're going to want to come to that. So Dr. Mary, congrats on having your work out there. The second is Dr. Wilmot Valmu. Dr. Wilmot, congratulations on retirement. So something, so just a little detail on Dr. Wilmot's retirement. He's had, he has a doctorate in biochemistry and a master's of healthcare administration degree in health policy and management. Yeah, he's got a lot of stuff going on right there. Um, his career spanned 34 years. So first he served as an orthopedic basic science research scientist at Columbia University for 10 years and UW for, four, for six and a half years. And at UW-Madison, he was the principal investigator and director of the orthopedic biosciences laboratory from 2000 to 2006. And then he transitioned to public health at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services for the last 17 years where he served as a regional immunization program advisor. Wow. <laughs> and so he is now retired as of last Sunday, March 31st, 2024. He is now retired. And so congratulations, Dr. Wilmot, on all of those things. And lastly, one other bragging right to share is Reverend Leda G and Dr. Fabu Carter are people we want to highlight. They are going to do a reception coming up. They're, they're hosting a panel called The Future of Global Feminism. Wow. Okay, that's something to brag about. That's pretty cool. So you can uh, take up more look online to see uh, what it is that they are up to in the times, the different things there. Um, they, they have a reception on Wednesday, April 10th. So that I believe that's this. Yep, yep, I'm out my dates right. That's this Wednesday from 4.30 to 6.30. And then this upcoming Saturday, April 13th at 11.45. Both of these things are free. Apparently, delicious Kenyan and American food are going to be served for free. So just be aware, you might want to show up and support them. And uh, I'm just thankful to see how each of these folks have been able to use what's in their hand and to exit to serve. And so we've, we've highlighted these things right here. All right, that is what we have for as far as bragging rights and everything today. Pastor Patrick's going to come up here and close us out. And we are ready to roll today. All right, thanks. Amen. Let's stand, you all. And just a quick reminder for um, the middle and high school ministries, there's something here tonight uh, for It's Not Monday Yet from 6 to 8 p.m. Men's ministry this coming Saturday from 9 to 11.30. Make sure you sign up. And Tyler has something else he's pointing at me about. I forgot. Uh, Wednesday night's Bible study over this entire series. Um, we are going to be discussing whatever passage we preached on and whatever character. We're going to have different characters. So if you're looking for a place where you want to go deeper into specifically what was Wednesday night or you just want to talk more about what's in your hand, Wednesday nights we are going to be doing this specific series and working through those passages. So I want to make sure you know that. Okay. Awesome. Wednesday nights. So men's ministry, Saturday, and then again the following Saturday on the 20th, 9 to 1130. Last thing, I see mom and dad and Island are in the house today. Good morning. Good to see you, mom and dad. Tyler will explain to you later why I'm saying that. Let's pray, you all. God, we thank you today for your blessings, for your mercy, for your favor, and what you have put in our hand, God. Lord, allow us to be obedient. Allow us to use that to bless others. Allow, allow us to submit that unto you. 
so that we can be the people of God, serving the people of God with wherever you tell us to go, Lord Jesus, and that we know that you are I am. We have entered this place to worship. Let us exit to serve and use what's in our hand to bless this nation. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.